Good morning. Um, are we online? Can we start? So, um, good morning, everyone. I'm Hannes Willem. I'm uh, the academic director of the Department of Engineering Hydrology at the RWTH Aachen University in Germany. I'm also the managing director of the UNESCO Chair on Hydrological Changes and Water Resources Management, the same university, and uh, I have the honor to uh, be the chair of the first session, which we are going to start now. So the topic we are going to cover today is cooperation for achieving water uh, security. And we have six speakers. I will do my best to moderate. We have only uh, Dr. Hisham Bekhid here is present, and the other five are online. So they are going to join us uh, using the video conference uh, once we uh, start. I just would like to link the idea of water scarcity to the transboundary water. Transboundary water poses enormous challenges for achieving water security. So transboundary is a key for conflict, but also giving us many opportunities to collaborate together. We didn't find actually better speaker than uh, Professor Pisawas to uh, cover the first speech in this uh, session. And then we will go to the Netherlands to uh, Professor Van Beek, then to uh, Portugal, and then to uh, Mr. Kovacs. The three of them, they are going to cover the first section of this session. And this section will be about transboundary in general, and they will give us one or two good practice that might help us in similar challenges. And then we move to the second part of the session, which we will have Dr. Passon. He's a South African expert, and he will be joining us from South Africa. And then we move to Cairo. Here in the room, we have Professor uh, Hisham Bekhid, my friend. And then we go also to Cairo, to Professor Mohammed Hilal, who is going to join us today from Cairo over video conference. And the three of them, they are going to cover the most challenging topic, which is the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. Um, two of these speakers are members of the negotiations team. So one of them is going to cover the technical angle, and the other one is going to cover the legal angle. So Dr. Hisham will speak about the technical part, and Dr. Hilal will cover the, uh, the legal dimension. So this will be the second section, so please stay with us. The second section is as important as the first one, and I promise you, you will enjoy both of them. So the transboundary water cooperation, it has to be tackled from different dimensions. So when we speak about transboundary water, we have to understand that there is a legal instrument. We have to accept that there is a legal instrument. Either we are going to follow the international law or any legal instrument that we should respect it. It has to be there. Either we are going to follow the equitable and reasonable utilization without causing significant harm, and this has to be respected. Um, an institutional structure is another dimension and capacity building. What are the institutions that are going to commit? Are these the ministries of water resources at the national level? And which international organizations will be involved, either in the monitoring or observation or whatever type of agreement we reach at the transboundary level? When I speak about the transboundary, it's not necessarily about rivers. It can be also groundwater. So, Exchange of information, and we have to trust each other. We have to have a sharing knowledge platform, exchange of data, sharing data, and these are also very important for transboundary water. A participatory approach, we have to involve the necessary stakeholders. There could be uh, uh, different engineers, consultancy, civil society, public could be also participate when necessary. Benefits and cost sharing, so we have to make sure that this type of collaborations or agreements are win-win. I personally say if the agreement or the collaboration is not win-win, we'll never sustain. 
So it has to be win in, win win in order to sustain. And finally, there should be a financial mechanism to support the entire process. Then, if we see these, these are the pillars to reach a transboundary water collaboration. So there are seven pillars, the ones I covered, to reach a transboundary collaboration between countries. So we are very honored today to have one of the leading scientists worldwide. He is Professor Psiros. He is distinguished visiting professor of the University of Glasgow, UK. He is a chairman. Uh, Water Management International Singapore, and also the Chief Executive Third World uh, Center for Water Management in Mexico. So he holds different positions in different countries. He is also universally acknowledged as one of the experts on water environment. His distinguished uh, career as an academic, as an advisor to several presidents and prime ministers worldwide in 19 different countries. He has six heads of, and six head of United Nations agencies, and I honestly, I couldn't continue writing the rest because otherwise I need a couple of pages. He has received a numerous, numerous number of awards. I give only examples, Crystal Drop and Millennium Prize of the International Water Resources Association and the Walter Hopper Prize of the American Society of Civil Engineers and Stockholm Water Prize as well. He also received seven honorary doctorates of technology or engineering from leading global universities. He has 950 publications, 8,500 citations. He also author of 88 books, which were transfer translated to 41 languages. I'm very happy and honored to uh, give the floor to Professor Pseros to cover the topic of managing transboundary rivers, lessons learned over 55 years of global nego negotiations. So please transfer the microphone to Professor Pseros online. Thank you. I want to share with you 55 years of experience on global negotiations on transboundary water. And there are many things I would like to share with you which are generally not included in this discussion. First is one major problem, and that is we water professionals think, at least implicitly think, that the sun and the moon revolves around water. Everything in the world revolves around water. Regrettably, that is not the case. Uh, the, nearly all countries now, water is seldom to be quite blunt in the political agenda. It comes into the political agenda only when there is a prolonged drought, a big flood, then the politicians become interested and then for all practical purposes, it disappears from the practical agenda, from the political agenda. Uh, and this is quite surprising because water is a very emotional issue. And in all countries, it's a big emotional issue. And uh, there's no other resource that comes close to water in terms of emotion. So the first thing I've learned is the negotiations between the two countries uh, on any transboundary water is a subset of uh, political social discipline. Basically, the political uh, relationship between the two countries. If the political relationship is good, uh, uh, they are reasonably uh, honest with each other, then negotiation will proceed, there will be ups and downs. It will take a few years, but negotiations will proceed. However, if the political uh, relations between the two countries are not good, it's going to be very difficult to get any chance boundary water negotiation, complete negotiation. And even if it's completed, the problem starts the day after the negotiation is complete. So that that is one first my first group is History dictates how things are going to turn up in water negotiations. 
Second rule I found is people have friends, but the countries have only interest. So today, one country's interest may be aligned with another country's interest, so the two countries can be friends. But simultaneously, they might be competitors. There are some areas they could be even be enemies. So there is in politics, there's nothing called friendship, where everything moves according to the country's perceived interest. Uh, and this interest, of course, as you can expect, changes with time. The third is I'm independent panel of experts. Few countries have tried it. The biggest problem I have found is in most cases, to be quite blunt, they have not worked. And it depends primarily, my experience has been IPOE, Independent Panel of Experts. IPOE works provided you have a chair who both the countries trust, they are quite honest with the chair, and the chair is perceptive enough to see how far they can push the country to make compromises. So the role of the chair is very important. The selection of the chair is very important. Uh, unfortunately, in most countries, very difficult to find such a person. And as a result of the, the IP practices, uh, have not worked very well. I do hope for the Grand Renes Adam it will work, but uh, I have no idea how, how, how to work out. Uh, the next one is one of the biggest problems in the transboundary water is it's a stationary treaty. No matter if Egypt and uh, Ethiopia comes to some agreement with the, with the Grand Rennes Dam or the sharing of water, that may be valid today. But just let me give you some... The, the world of water is changing and the world is changing. In Egypt now, the Egyptian population is now 102 million. Ethiopia uh, is 114 million. In, 20, in 2150, Egypt population will be 160 million, and Ethiopia's population will be similarly going up. Both countries will increase by about 58 million people. But the question is, when one of the biggest questions of all trans, transboundary waters is yes, in those successful cases where the treaty has worked the first 10, 15, 20 years, or even 30 years, situation changed so much that after 20, 30 years, the stationary treaty doesn't work. And unfortunately, if, you, if I look into the water profession and the legal profession, for every Perhaps for every 1,000 papers that are coming out, or 100,000 papers that are coming out on transboundary waters, conflict cooperation, most of them are basically don't make much advance, but there's a lot of papers. From at least for 100,000 papers, it would be hard pressed to find one or two papers which even discuss how to develop living treaties. That means, how do we modify the treaty as the world step along? Because in 2050, Egypt will be a different country. Ethiopia will be a different country. And whatever you negotiate now will be not valid uh, by that time. So we have to start thinking about uh, in the international water, how do we de develop treaties, develop uh, living treaties which modify with time and which would be updated at reasonable intervals and what could be the process to update the treaty. And if the two countries will be willing to do that. And that has been one of, in my view, one of the biggest problems in the transboundary water. Most of the treaties, virtually all the treaties we have signed, are become obsolete after a few years, and the countries do not like it anymore, and we simply do not know how to move from state one to state two. Uh, now, the next item I would like to share with you is each case of transboundary collaboration is unique. European, for example, European transboundary water experiences, they are basically on water quality. They would be very difficult to apply in water quantity. Issues like 
the issues we face on transplantary water in the developing world is primarily the quantity, not so much with quality. Quality is the important issue, but the quantity predominates. And the reverse is in Europe. So the European experiences, in my view, will be, of, will be of some use, but not very much use, because the focus is primarily on the water quality. Uh, so, and the final point is, irrespective of what we talk of transboundary water, one of the main things for the developing countries, especially for Egypt and uh, Ethiopia, the biggest problem Egypt and Ethiopia faces, faces now, how to decouple its economy with water intensity. How do we make water uh, less, water use less intensive? Both countries, agriculture is the largest user of water. How do we reduce the agriculture without sacrificing production? How do we reduce the water footprint of agriculture, industry, etc.? Um, and it is possible, for example, in the 19, in the 1990s, if I look what water use for the agriculture sector in China in the 1990s, and 2010, the uh, water redu reduction almost is used by agriculture per, per hectare per, per almost 20%. And it does not mean that food production declined by 20%, but by using uh, water more effectively, food production actually almost, in many cases, increased by 50 to 60%. So there's a false thinking that we have to have we have to have water commensurate with agricultural needs. And if you look at China's agricultural needs by 2030, its production will increase again very, very significantly. What we expect 40 to 50 percent increase in production, but the water intensity of agriculture will go down remarkably. So for for this based on the Chinese experience, what do we need? We need institutional policy reform, not on paper, but in reality. Uh, the investment by the government, both in terms of science, technology, knowledge transfer, and basically to include local, technical, regulatory, and economic programs. And the other important thing in, the, in the China, now we're seeing China's Contrary to popular belief, China, some, in some of the states in China, like Hubei province, China's agricultural area run by uh, cooperatives are now as big as, uh, as big as any large American farm. These are run, not, uh, these are land is owned by individual farmers. They join the cooperative voluntarily. Initially, most farmers do not want to join. But when they saw that benefit, of co cooperating together and being run not as a small farm but as a large conglomerate by NBAs and, and uh, other experienced people. They saw significant increase their income and as a result of which they all voluntarily join and they get, depending on the land holding, they get a percentage of their income of, the, of that cooperative. So we have to start thinking in Egypt and India and other places, we have to start thinking of how do we change the institutional arrangement so that the life of the farmers will improve? And remember, after COVID-19, things are getting even bleaker because the investment available will be, will be less. So uh, there has to be more than employment generation. And in the farm, employment in the farming community is still predominant in developing countries. So we have to start looking at Many of the things, just not looking at the transboundary water, but the individual components that go into managing transboundary water. With that, I'll return to the chair, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Microphone. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Pesewas, for uh, the speech. Um, we could catch some of the important points. 
but I think there was something with the audio that we cannot control from here. But thank you very much for this uh, uh, um, keynote speech that you provided. And uh, I kindly ask all the people online or the audience, please, to write your questions and orient it to the speaker you would like to ask. But write it, please, directly in the text. Don't wait to the end of the session, because somebody will be collecting them and bringing them to us here to read for the audience in the room. So thank you again.